All right, so what we're gonna talk about now is just we're gonna go through um, that vertebral evolution or how the vertebral column has changed throughout the course of those early vertebrates compared to tetrapods and mammals as well. So starting with those early vertebrates, uh, we're just gonna use a couple of household items here from my pantry, but we've got almonds, which are gonna represent those trunk vertebrae, and then the pine nuts are gonna represent those chondral vertebrae. So overall in uh, the vertebral column of early, vert early vertebrates, there's very little specialization and uh, very little aclinality overall. Um, just a few arches that would um, be more suited for a more realistic model and for some rib attachment. But other way, those ribs weren't very prominent in those early vertebrates, especially in the Enzlamobronchi or a shark. So like I said, very little uh, vertebral differentiation here. Going up to next the tetrapods, um, you can see immediately that there's a little bit more specialization already. Um, there's going to be a, only a few specializations um, in that there's zygopotheses present in those early tetrapods, which really just became prominent and important for uh, their transition onto land. They're going to have a little more weight bearing that they're going to need to handle, as well as uh, those zygopotheses are going to help with their anti-twist or anti, uh, a little less flexibility, a little more rigid. And then finally, for those mammals, um, that's gonna where that's where we as humans fall under, obviously. So we've got the most vertebral specialization, and so we really have five different um, vertebral segments here. So the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and then again caudal with those pine nuts. But here you're gonna find the most um, specialization as far as apophyses go, um, and as well as those ends of those vertebral segments or those uh, individual vertebrae are gonna be acelous, so those both, end, both ends are gonna be flat. Gonna be one big centrum, other than two centra. All right, so to finally talk about the differences in the pectoral girdle of the early fish to early touch part of the mammal. First things to remember are that the pectoral girdle actually, in early fish, was completely attached to the skull. It's not like the early touch pods in the mammals in that um, it was suspended by a muscular sling supported in, through ligaments, but uh, actually the early fish had a direct connection um, through uh, endochondral and derma elements of the skull to the pectoral girdle and uh, actually separated the head from the trunk of the fish. So to talk a little bit more detailed about the specific anatomy is this starting with number four, which is the posttemporal um, it's also going to represent the supraclethrum and the postclethrum, but actually all three of those are not going to be present in the early tetrapod of the mammal. But other than that, the majority of everything else that I'll be pointing out is going to be retained. The shape's going to change, but the bones themselves will be retained. So then next, um, directly uh, ventral to number four is going to be the clethrum. And then directly ventral to that, this uh, small lobe coming off the left side um, number two is actually the scapula and that's going to be where you're going to see the biggest changes in shape um, as the early touch part of the mammal because of those weight bearing uh, necessities that they had with their terrestrial environment and lastly uh, number one is the clavicle so it'll be the clavicle and the intraclavicle those will uh, actually get a little bit smaller as well but like i said will stay retained so then going to the early tetrapod, a little bit simpler uh, formation, the clethrum by itself without the post of the supra. This is gonna be a little bit more prominent. And, and then as we can see in number two, again, the scapula is starting to become prominent as the uh, terrestrial environment. And then the clavicle again with number one, with the, the clavicle itself on the uh, external side and then in the uh, yeah, middle is gonna be the interclavicle. Lastly is going to be the mammal. So um, if you kind of take into context what we've seen in the previous two, this scapula here at number two is obviously much, much larger compared to the two other stages. Um, and the clethrum is retained, uh, fairly similar shape to that of the early tetrapod. And then finally, the um, clavicle is going to be a little bit bigger, but um, fairly similar to that of the early tetrapod. Again, just to reiterate, that largest difference is going to be the prominence of the scapula because um, it's going to provide for a lot more muscular attachment 
which is going to be needed for those mammals as their terrestrial environment is becoming the primary location as well as the need for efficient locomotion. Other than that, it's just uh, important to remember that as um, the early fish and the early tetrapod of the mammal evolved, um, there's more of a trend in the loss of derma elements and the increased prominence of those endocrine draw elements as you evolve from into the early tetrapods and then into the mammals. And then just to kind of to round out everything on the back end, that pelvic girdle that was floating in the musculature of the early fish then becomes directly attached with a rigid connection to the early touch in the early touch pods and the mammals to provide further support. Okay, so for the last concept, uh, talking through the differences between the sprawling orientation or limb position of a lot of the uh, tetrapods versus the vertical orientation that Lewis has here um, in most or all mammals. But just to get right down to it, um, this vertical orientation, as you can see, his forelimbs and his hind limbs are situated directly underneath his axial skeleton connected by the appendicular or connected by the pelvic and pectoral girdles pardon me um, but really this vertical orientation is going to be really beneficial for efficient locomotion of course a lot of it depends on the environmental conditions um, because there are plenty of uh, tetrapods that have efficient uh, sprawling posture like the vascular lizard but what the vertical orientation kind of results in in these mammals is a really increased prominence of the scapula and obviously you can't see the intricate anatomical details but you can feel them which is really interesting once you have the knowledge to go behind it um, but like I said that scapula is going to become really prominent and there's going to be a loss or reduction of the media elements so uh, the procorcoid, the corcoid or the, the cleithrium, some of those um, bones that aren't going to be. Okay so secondly is the sprawling posture of terrestrial locomotion. It's the most archaic of the locomotion um, and it's going to be visualized just how this stuffed animal is laid out on the table. The limbs, instead of um, going on a planar or vertical um, trajectory like in most or in all the mammals, this uh, posture is used by all um, limbed reptiles and salamanders and it's just going to be um, a step that's taken like this um, sprawled out from the side of their exoskeleton and their torso is actually going to flex as well from side to side depending on which step they're taking in order to try to maximize the distance um, or the efficiency of their locomotion. All right so now just to talk about a few of the broader but simpler concepts in in that discussion post for unit two. Uh, I've got a great live cadaver right behind me. So we're gonna just go over kind of how the skeletal system has its benefits or what the, the purposes of the skeletal system are. And then as well as some of those problems that us as humans have um, since we're bipedal. So to start, there's the cadaver. Um, that skeletal system is gonna give support and structure to the body. As you can tell, even though we can't see the skeleton, we know that it's there under all of that um, soft tissue layer. It's going to give us shape, so it's a classic bipedal human shape, upright. Um, you can see the shoulders and the joints, the cranium positioned directly on top of the uh, vertebral column. And then those bones are also going to store a lot of calcium for us. So if we remember that calcium feedback loop with uh, the thyroid and the parathyroid glands supplying calcitonin and parathyroid hormone that either um, signal or don't signal the osteoblast and osteoclast, so that calcium is going to be in there, in the bloodstream and in the bones. Um, sensory systems are also a huge part of what makes us human, and there's a lot of skeletal components to those as well. So if we think about the malleus, the incus um, of the ear, those are obviously really important for us, but then even more so, some of the more common sensory system is, our, is the turbinates inside the nasal cavity. Um, otherwise, Kind of the last few, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, it's going to protect other soft tissue as well. So the sternum and the ribs um, are going to be really important for protecting those visceral organs, um, stuff that's vital to us, our survival. And then the last thing is provides attachment for our other muscles. So um, our ability to move or to have kinetic movement is all dependent on those muscular attachments. 
if you think about the uh, neural spines are a really great example of where muscle can attach to give us even more support but also allow for our kinetics. That being said, bipedal has a lot of advantages but a few disadvantages as well. Um, first off, as you can see here, there's that curved spine, that classic curvature that um, is still present even as we have developed into walking just on two legs and that puts a lot of strain on the lower back later in life um, and with those intervertebral discs that kind of gives us the opportunity like what they call slipping a disc for other um, lumbar problems um, other than that because we have so much weight above our body with our heads our organs um, a lot of our skeletal system of the axial portion is above some of our most uh, valuable and biggest joints so the inward projection of the femur actually angles all of that upper body weight over the knees and that's going to put a lot of strain on those joints as well I know people say don't lift with your back lift with your legs um, that saves the back for a lot of instances but then all of those all that weight is going to be placed on those knees and causes problems for other joints like the ankles as well later in life um, the last couple of things were the varicose veins, which because we have such an uh, elongated body posture, those veins that are running far away from the heart actually fight gravity so much more compared to uh, you know, a quadrupedal terrestrial animal. So there's a lot of problems, like I said, the varicose veins where there's um, bulging or buildup of blood as you get older because that um, blood is having a tough time getting pumped all the way back up to your heart. And then, I guess, um, more anthropologically related, um, us on two legs and the evolution of our feet has uh, kind of diminished our environmental living situation. Um, if you think about common ancestors, there's a lot of evidence that points to um, ancestors that were able to be bipedal but still actually had arboreal environments, or living environments. But us as bipedal kind of uh, cut that environmental possibility in half, so it made it much made us much more likely to only be living in a terrestrial environment rather than an arboreal.